Hello, I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager, and welcome to In Conversation With, the podcast series that delves into the world of financial services and brings you face-to-face with some of the most notable figures in the industry. Listen as we discuss topics that are currently facing the industry and hear from visionary CEOs to disruptive innovators as we bring you a diverse array of voices and perspectives. We'll explore the challenges they faced, the lessons they've learned, and the insights they have to share about the ever-evolving landscape of financial services. Hello and welcome to In Conversation With. I'm Kimberly Dondo, Digital Content Manager, and in today's episode, I'm joined by David Kay, founder and CEO at Puma Capital Group. Uh, so thank you for joining me today, David. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted. Um, so could you share your journey to becoming CEO of Puma Capital Group? Sure. Well, it's uh, quite an unconventional uh, route into fund management uh, and eventually setting up uh, Puma Capital Group uh, well, over a decade ago now, uh, because I started my professional career as a barrister, um, mm-hmm. which is typically getting involved in sorting out commercial disputes when everything has gone wrong. Um, but I always knew that I wanted to be involved in creating uh, a business, not just advising uh, businesses. So after five or so years at the bar, I took the decision to join an investment bank, a small investment bank uh, in Mayfair called Shaw Capital, which was back in 2006. So Mm -hmm. with genius foresight, I had decided to join an investment bank just prior to the global financial crisis, which was Uh a very smart decision. So I initially joined, having been a barrister, I initially joined as legal counsel, but very quickly my role um, developed into a commercial role. And one of the most interesting things I got involved in from the start was a German real estate fund that Shaw Capital was setting up in early 2006. And I was fortunate enough to be part of that launch team. And when I say team, uh, there were really a couple of people. Um, We had a very small infrastructure, nobody on the ground in Germany at the start. And I spent the next few years working with colleagues and building up a team of 30 30 or 40 people, um, creating effectively a business there uh, and buying uh, a large portfolio um, of real estate assets, which performed well. And Mm -hmm. I think that really, it started me on my journey towards thinking about having a a standalone fund management business. So fast forwarding quite a few years, working across a broad range of of activities within Shore Capital, I approached the Shore Capital board with a business plan to launch Puma Capital. As I say, that was about 10 or so years ago. And fast forward through that journey, we now have four business. Uh, We have Puma Investments, which your uh, listeners hopefully will be familiar with. That's our flagship uh, business focusing uh, on working with financial advisors to deliver long-term financial planning solutions for their clients. Um, And then we have really three deployment businesses that utilize the capital that we raise uh, to deploy in primarily private assets, which I, I'm sure we'll come on and talk about. And they yeah. are, we're not very ad- adventurous when it comes to naming things. So our, our three deployment businesses are Puma Private Equity. Uh, we're most well known for our Puma VCTs, which we're now uh, on our 14th VCT. Puma Property Finance, where we've lent uh, well over one and a quarter billion pounds um, across the UK. And I can talk a little bit more about that. And Puma Public Market markets, which focuses uh, on the AIM market. And we've been running a successful service since, well, since June 2014 um, and has one of the the leading track records of AIM managers. So we're very proud of that. So in total now, my journey um, after 10 or so years setting up and running at Puma Capital, we now have over 100 people, um, nearly a billion pounds of, of AUM, over 7,000 clients, and uh, hopefully uh, still growing. Okay. Um, and going back to uh, that piece about par- private assets, how can private assets help IFAs to diversify their client portfolios and why are private assets a good tool to help IFAs diversify their clients' prof- 
portfolios? Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. It's it's around diversification. We believe that the days, and we're not alone, actually, the days of the 60-40 portfolio, 60% in equities, 40% in bonds, we think are over. And that's been really uh, come to the fore over the last, I'd say, 12 or 18 months. The theory in the olden days, if, if I can put it that way, was that you would have that diversification in your portfolio because if equity markets fell, typically um, central banks would cut interest rates to support the economy, which would mean bond yields would drop and bond prices would rise. So Mm -hmm. your 40% or so bond exposure was a diversification tool, a defensive tool um, to balance out equity risk over the long term. But what we've seen over the last 12 or 18 months is that there's been a massive revaluation of equity markets. Um, but at the same time, uh, which we haven't seen before, we've seen big volatility movements and swings in bond market prices. And actually, what we're seeing is inflation has been very high. Obviously, interest rates have, have been increased to try and deal with that. But in certain cases, bond values have actually fallen, not risen. So we think that old orthodoxy of the 60-40 portfolio is, is, is pretty much dead. And what we hear from advisors and we see increasingly, uh, and again, this is not being driven by us, we, we, we are very much reacting to it, is that um, there is a, a significant shift towards having a hub and spoke approach to investment portfolios, by which I mean in the in the hub, in the center, if you imagine a wheel, uh, will be made up of predominantly lower cost ETF stroke tracker passive strategies, which reduces the overall cost to clients. And that will be supplemented by spokes trying to deliver alpha outperformance. Where are you going to get that? Well, you're going to get that from, we say, your private markets accessing uh, assets which are not necessarily directly correlated to the equity market. So they can perform even in downturns on the equity markets and private assets, interestingly now, um, we think present you know, for the first time in a very long time, a really exciting opportunity for, for um, advisors, clients, and something that we're working hard to find solutions to be able to offer uh, these kind of products to clients on top of what, what we already do. And in two particular ways, I would say, one, a private debt You know, we've lived through for many, many years a very low interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. But what we have seen now is that the uh, 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 the interest rates are in the fives now, which means that we can lend money to property developers as we've been doing for many, many years, but at rates that are much higher than we've ever been able to charge, which is great because for investors, that means they can get a a higher risk adjusted return because Mm -hmm. we only lend on a first charge basis with security against real assets in the UK, which is great. And now we're able to do that, but with the added benefit of of a higher return profile than we've ever been able to achieve as the Bank of England has increased uh, interest rates. And the second area where I also see uh, real interest and growth for private assets is is private equity. We have a government, and I think actually, even if there's a change of colour in government, this will persist where um, there is a real recognition that SMEs are the backbone of the UK economy. Mm -hmm. You know, SMEs create more jobs than large companies. And that's a phenomenon you see in the Western, in Western economies around the world. And what's exciting about that is that we can really focus on parts of the economy that are starved of capital and um, we are already investing in those uh, growth companies and we've got the opportunity to double down and actually increase uh, our exposure to that and that's a great thing for for the UK economy so you know for me as 
advisors think about building their clients' portfolios, they're thinking about the cost of those portfolios and using passive strategies is a way of reducing cost. But they, I think, will want to supplement that with the diversification, but also the added return that can come from private assets. And, and, and for me, lending and private equity are two really good examples of how private assets can can really deliver that diversification, but also a higher return. Okay. And I was wondering about what your thoughts on the mansion house reforms uh, could mean for VCT and EIS investors. Sure. Well, we're very supportive of anything that stimulates investment into the um, small and mid to tier private equity world. And I think um, what's exciting for VCT and EIS investors is that you will, if these um, reforms are followed through on and are taken up, what you will see is additional capital coming into this sector, which is great because you want an ecosystem. You, you might think that the Jerk is well, no, you know, VCT investors, we, we run you know, some successful uh, large amounts of VCT uh, funds. Oh, we mm-hmm. wouldn't want competition. On the contrary, we want a vibrant ecosystem. We would like that the, the allocation of part of pension fund allocation to go into this space because it will generate the opportunity to sell assets once we've done our job and helped businesses scale up to that next stage of growth. There may be another institutional investor who wants to come in to a slightly larger business um, and take that on and make a further private equity investment. And actually, that's what we think is most likely to happen. We think that given the scale of capital that pension funds have available, they won't want to be necessarily investing in the two to 10 million pound bracket, which is where we um, invest in our companies. They'll want to take those companies off our hands, which we think um, is only good news for VCT and EIS investors, because one of the most important things when you are making private equity investments, and indeed when you're lending money, is to always think about your exit. You, mm. We are taking responsibility for our investors' money, and we take that responsibility really seriously. And when I sit investment committees and credit committees, one of the main focuses that we have is, okay, we like this business, we like the people, we think that the service or product is really interesting and scalable, but we're also thinking on behalf of our investors – how do we get out? How yeah. do we generate a successful exit for our clients? So I think the mansion house reforms provide additional capital, which I think will be really beneficial for VCTs and EIS. And I don't see it as competitive. I see it really as additive to that whole ecosystem. And how is Puma uh, contributing to diversity and regional growth in venture capital post the Treasury Committee report? Well, you might be able to detect that I'm a northerner. I'm very yeah. proud of it. I uh, Some people can't detect it because I've lived in uh, the south for a very long time now. But um, I, I, I was dragged up in Bury, uh, in Greater Manchester, um, and actually, you know, go off and back to Manchester into the northwest. And we're very fortunate um, at Puma because we have people based all over the the United Kingdom and very much with our deployment, I was talking about our lending activities, our private equity activities, we think of ourselves very much as looking at the whole of the UK. We have lent hundreds of millions of pounds in Scotland, uh, in Belfast, we've lent money, we've invested in in small businesses and medium-sized businesses right across the UK uh, and, and Northern Ireland. So we are very passionate about uh, the levelling up agenda and about getting capital across the UK. Um, Maybe that's a little bit from me being a northerner and thinking that there's some really fantastic opportunities and businesses out there. We recently launched actually a a Manchester office and we're continuing to hire and recruit there. And um, we're looking at at a, a place potentially in Scotland in due course as well. And we will continue to grow. So why am I explaining that? Well, for for us, the regional growth um, is really important. That's We think it's our responsibility to our investors to be exploring those opportunities. 
But diversity is also at the heart of what we've built as a business over the last decade at, at Puma. One of the things I'm most proud about, actually, is that um, our stats, if you like, are, I think, you know, industry leading. We have um, a female to male ratio of, of 49 to 51, which mm. is so broadly 50-50. 32% of our staff are from underrepresented backgrounds. And this is really interesting. The majority of our heads of department are female. Oh, wow. And so that's a product of us really thinking about how we're going to challenge some of the um, usual things you find, particularly in financial services. And we hope that that then reflects in the kind of investment decisions that we make. We think diversity is critical, not only as a social good, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing to do, but also because you make better decisions with the diversity of opinion around the table. And we don't just sort of say those kind of things. We've actually uh, created recently, uh, which I'm also really proud of, the Puma Capital Group Foundation. And we've actually earmarked tens of thousands of pounds from our own profits to go into that foundation. Mm -hmm. and, and one of our key, we have really two objectives with that foundation. One of the key ones is social mobility. And that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do. If you and the way we're living that, for example, is we recently hosted um, uh, and supported the Ten Thousand Black Intern Program and Future VC. So we're putting our money where our mouth is, and we're actually trying to create opportunities for people to see financial services from all sorts of backgrounds. And if I may, you know, there's also a personal agenda there. You know, I came from Manchester, as I mentioned. My mm -hmm. I was pretty much grew up in a working class environment. I was very fortunate to um, go to a fantastic school called Manchester Grammar, where I had an assisted place. Assisted mm -hmm. places don't uh, uh, any longer exist, but basically for those that could not afford it, in, in those days, the government were able to provide support. And so providing those opportunities for people from those backgrounds where I came from mm -hmm. and to get into financial services is actually really important to me personally and interestingly important to a lot of people in our business. So it has become one of our, as I say, one of our two core objectives with our Puma Capital Foundation. And so we're, you know, we're really excited about supporting diversity and regional growth um, in venture capital, but also in, in lending, in all of our activities across the group. Yeah. And I think um, it goes back to that saying that it has to start from the top. So obviously, with you being so passionate about it, it does trickle down uh, to the rest of the business. So that makes complete sense. Um, yeah, they're probably, that you're able to they're probably bored of me banging on about it. But I think no, but I think it has um, definitely captured people's imagination, not just from me. They, they, there's actually quite a lot of people who have similarly diverse backgrounds. And we feel as a business, we do a better job for our advice advisors, for our investors, having that breadth of experience and, um, and diversity. Okay. Um, and going back, uh, so what opportunities do private markets present for financial advisors, especially with the recent changes like the lifetime allowance scrapping? Well, it's really an interesting uh, area, and, and I think that took a lot of people, and frankly, I would admit me included, uh, by mm -hmm. surprise. Um, in, and I think there was an initial uh, thinking that, oh, this is a panacea. This is the long-term solution for uh, financial advisors when they're thinking about, for example, estate planning, intergenerational uh, wealth transfer, so inheritance tax planning. Um, this would be the solution. Because when you actually look at the detail of the scrapping of the lifetime allowance, especially for higher earners, they are still capped at £60,000 per annum that can be contributed into a pension. Mm -hmm. and, and, and most importantly, one also has to think about the wrapper. A pension is relatively inflexible and you, you have obviously lots and uh, lots of rules around how much you can take out and the tax consequences of taking out at which stage. And so if your circumstances uh, change and uh, are the financial advice listening that they will be discussing this with their clients, then a pension might not be uh, the best answer. So whilst it does provide 
tax benefits, including inheritance tax benefits. I think it's important that advisors think about other things that they can do that also have a bit more flexibility. So, for example, um, and we talk about this a lot, but but business relief, uh, which is a relief that's available um, when you invest in trading companies, hold those shares for two years, and at the point of death, they the value of those assets uh, will sit outside an individual's estate um, on death. So they'll save the 40% inheritance tax. And one mm-hmm. can access business relief through a, a listed route or through AIM, certain AIM stocks. And we run a successful AIM inheritance tax service and also the unlisted or, or, or not AIM route. Um, and there we've really focused and doubled down on what we were talking about earlier in the uh, private lending space. And as I say, lend over a one and a quarter billion um, across the UK. And I'm very proud to say we've never lost a pound of capital in in, in all that lending over a long period, including uh, over COVID, which if there was ever a test for a lending book, I think COVID threw up all the challenges that you um, that you, that you'd want to um, at at a, a, a lending book, and I think we we came through that extremely well, and, and we didn't have capital loss. So I think um, for me, when advisors are thinking and sitting down with clients, yes, lifetime allowance lifting is important for people to think about. It does add to the benefits of a pension and over a long period of time can be very creative, but it should not be the only thing. It is not, in my opinion, a panacea. And things mm-hmm. like business relief, obviously ISAs, um, sometimes you can combine the two together. You know, as, as I'm sure your listeners will know, you can now and have been actually for 10 years been able to hold AIM stocks in your ISA. Well, you mm-hmm. can then combine the tax efficiency of an ISA uh, during your lifetime with inheritance tax relief on death um, if you hold certain name stocks. So for me, uh, I, and, and I'm sure your listeners will absolutely appreciate this, it's a super complex model. That's why they exist to provide that kind of advice to clients. And I think it's oversimplistic to look at the lifetime allowance scrapping and say, well, I'll just put everything in my pension. They are not flexible. Uh, and I think alongside other tools uh, is probably the best way to think about uh, using a pension. Yeah. And you've started sharing some of your success stories, but could you share any more recent success stories showca- showcasing uh, Puma's approach to bridging institutional and retail investing? Absolutely. Well, it's it's really been at the heart of our business plan. You know, when I set up Puma um, and, and we grew out of Shore Capital and I made a pitch to the Shore Capital board to basically take um, what they had run as the Puma VCTs for several years. And, and my vision was that we could create a business um, around initially those VCTs, build, building on that track record um, and really actually telling people about them because Shore Capital had really raised it from friends and family and and uh, a network and rather than actually talking to financial advisors about the great track record um that was our insight that's when we started Puma we thought well actually let's just tell people about it mm-hmm. and why am I going back to there because when I started my vision was that we should be a business that is capable of attracting both private clients yeah. and institutional clients. And if you can do that at the same time, you can provide a really interesting platform for um, private clients, for retail investors, because what they will then get access to is institutional grade uh, platform. And I'm, I'm pleased to say within, and we are part way along this journey with our different deployment businesses, but Puma Property Finance has already, already raised half a billion pounds of institutional capital Mm -hmm. which we're able to lend alongside our retail capital, which means that we can do larger deals. We Mm -hmm. we have a great brand in the market. Puma Property Finance is well known as one of the leading um, uh, property finance uh, businesses lending to professional developers across the UK. We're lending typically £10 million to £50 million per loan. And we're able to play in that space because not only do we have uh, our retail capital, which we really 
protect and look after and, and nurture, and that continues to grow, we also have attracted institutional capital. So those retail investors are getting access to the same team of people with the same opportunities um, uh, to, to deploy capital. And what we'd like to do with our private equity business is to repeat that, to actually go on the same journey. And so far, we've been very successful, I think, in, in raising um, the right amount of money. You know, we don't ever want to raise too much too much money at any one time. We've been quite conservative as we've grown our VCTs and EIS services over time. But we think um, we, we've got the opportunity to scale that. We've got a team, large team in London, a growing team in Manchester. Manchester, and we're adding to that all the time. And we think now we've got a really interesting opportunity to, to, to grow and hopefully uh, do what we've done with Pumbaa Property Finance, which is attract institutional capital alongside our private client capital in due course. Yeah. And it'll be exciting to see that happen, I guess. Um, but finally, I wanted to ask, how does Puma educate financial advisors and investors about the benefits and risks of private asset investing? It's really important, actually, and, and especially when you're, you know, we take this responsibility seriously. We are taking responsibility for people's real money. I always talk about this, you know, with our team. This is real people's life savings that yeah. we are handling, that we are we're not just advising, we're taking responsibility for that capital. So we do need to make sure that we explain to financial advisors exactly how we do what we do uh, and give them the tools to help give their clients the best advice. So how do we do it and, and, and how do we think about that? Well, actually, one of the things that we work hard on is bringing in external experts who can validate what we're saying. So we've had a very successful series of webinars that are phenomenally well attended by um, a tax expert called Tony Wickenden, who's mm -hmm. a great personality, but also extremely um, uh, well yeah, expert in his field and yes. expert in explaining how um, advisors can help their clients using uh, all the available um, planning opportunities that there are, whether that's business relief or thinking about VCTs and EIS, how that overlaps with pension planning. You know, he's, uh, he's at the forefront of that. So we have invested in that and partnered with him. Mm -hmm. And one of our other uh, things that we're very proud of is we've just relaunched, literally hot off the press in the last mm -hmm. few days, a brand new Puma Investments website, which we've packed full of all sorts of tools for advisors. And just mm -hmm. to highlight two very quickly, we have a whole range now of case studies, which mm -hmm. bring to life real life examples of where clients have used products or combinations of products to deal with certain things. So for example, if a client has sold their business and made a large capital gain, what kind of things can a financial advisor be thinking about to help that client through that next journey? So we've done that. And we've also added some really um, funky uh, self-serve illustrations. So we've always had illustrations, but now advisors can actually go on our website themselves. And in three or four minutes, um, fill in a couple of details about the potential investment, let's say, in, in Puma Heritage, which is our VR offering um, that lends money to developers, as I was talking about earlier. They can generate um, a, a, an illustration. It will show the investor uh, what the return could be over 10 years on a moderate basis, on a high performing basis, on a low performing basis with very clear graphs explaining the benefits of that product to their client all at the touch of a button and delivered to their inbox within you know three minutes we spent a lot of time and money really thinking about how to do that because um, we think that you need to be transparent with advisors. What are the fees? How does that impact the overall return over time? What are the likely scenarios? And, and, and we think that we've created something that's a real added benefit for, for, for advisors as they think about some of these really quite complicated things with their clients. Right. Yeah. Well, those seem like all um, really good tools and useful ways for advisors to understand exactly what it is that you do and what they can do for their clients. Um, but it was so great talking to you today, David. Thank you for speaking with me. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you very much. 
Thank you for listening to In Conversation With. We do hope that you enjoyed it. Please do keep up to date with all our new releases via Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can also keep up to date with all our new content published on the Money Marketing website, as well as our print edition, Money Marketing Magazine. So make sure to subscribe. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. See you next time.